The last book of the Bible is the book of Revelation, and it tells us that the battle of Armageddon is coming. What's Armageddon really all about? It's time to separate the facts from the fiction. Welcome, here we go. This is part five of a five-part series called The Elijah Prophecy, uh, where Whitehorse Media has joined forces with uh, David Machado and Revelation of Love Ministries. Uh, we've been going through the Elijah Prophecy in Malachi chapter four that says that Elijah the prophet will come before the day of the Lord. And in the earlier programs, we went to First and First Kings chapter 17 and 18, talking about Elijah and what happened with him, with uh, King Ahab and the false prophets of Baal and the showdown on Mount Carmel, and how the fire came down and burned up the sacrifice. Then we went to uh, Matthew in the book of Luke in the New Testament and showed how very clearly Jesus said that John the Baptist, he was the Elijah who was to come, showing that John fulfilled, at least in part, uh, the Elijah prophecy from Malachi chapter 4. I know that's a lot to swallow, but that's what we've been dealing with. And now we're going to go to the book of Revelation, and we're going to tie all these threads together surrounding the battle of, of Armageddon. So, David, uh, great to be doing this with you. I feel like we're really connecting. We've been having a fantastic series of Bible studies. Appreciate your being up here in North Idaho with us. It's beautiful here, and it's been really a joy to be interacting and having this study with you. I feel like we could do a 10-part series if we really wanted to with yes. how smoothly God has been leading. Yeah. But we are finally at our last part, and this is probably my favorite part because it just brings it all together with what, what do we do with this? Well, That's what's right. our role in this last message, Elijah's right. message? That's right. And, and let me just again stress what we've been through. Malachi 4 verses 5 and 6 is a prophecy that Elijah will come before the day of the Lord. And then we looked at 1 Kings 17 and 18 and what happened back then in Elijah's real life, the real Elijah, mm -hmm. his uh, literal, the literal Elijah. And then we looked at uh, Matthew and Luke in the New Testament and Jesus clearly said that John the Baptist was, at least in part, fulfilling the prophecy of Elijah. Jesus said he is the Elijah that was to come. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees didn't understand that. They thought that uh, where's the real Elijah? If Jesus is really the Messiah, where's the real Elijah? And the disciples asked Jesus about that, and he clarified that it was John, and they missed it. They didn't understand. And that leads us to the book of Revelation, that just like John partially fulfilled the Elijah prophecy in a way that the religious leaders of, of that time weren't expecting, so we have in the book of Revelation a final manifestation of God's message in the spirit and power of Elijah that uh, is going to be different from what mainstream Christianity is expecting, mm. but it's, it's the word of God. So if the Elijah message is the last message to be given before Christ comes back, what is the last message? How do, what, is, what, what does Revelation say it's going to be? And, and it's the greatest message. It's a final message of mercy to mankind. And it's found in Revelation chapter 14. It's the three angels' messages that, that summarize everything that Elijah's message gave, that John the Baptist echoed. This is our mission. This is our message. And what a privilege it is to, to be able to be a part of the spirit and the power that Elijah had long ago, that John the Baptist had, and now we are to have by God's grace. That's right. And we read in, in part four where the angel Gabriel told Zechariah that John would prepare a people for the Lord. Yes. And so, and we know that the original Elijah prophecy in Malachi 4 says that Elijah is coming before the great and terrible day of God. And John the Baptist didn't do that. He came before the first coming of Christ at the time of the first coming of Christ, but he didn't come before the great and big and final day of the Lord, which tells us that there was, there's going to be a final fulfillment. Yes. Uh, and, and again, I thought about this just like 
uh, the wise men came from the east when Jesus was born, and the religious leaders couldn't accept that because he was outside of, of mainstream Israel. Uh, so we have in the book of Revelation, we have a message that doesn't come from within mainstream Christianity, but it's still God's message, and it's just like Elijah himself was sent to a, a widow who wasn't part of Israel, uh, and she took care of him and, and fed him. Uh, that shows us that God doesn't always work within the confines of what we think he's going to do. That's right. That's right. He's, uh, he often works outside of the box. Mm -hmm. There's twists and turns and unexpected uh, things that, I mean, nobody expected uh, a humble Messiah to be born in Bethlehem and then to die on a cross. That's right. That was not something people were expecting mm -hmm. and then rise from the dead. Mm -hmm. So let's go to Revelation and let's look uh, our conviction is that the three angels' messages, this is the Elijah message, yep. and, and the Elijahs in the final days are the people like John who are giving this message. Yeah, and I, I, like, I like to kind of hit that first. In Revelation 14, 12, it describes the class of people that are preaching the three angels' messages. Okay. It says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. That's exactly what Elijah emphasized the commandments of God, Malachi emphasized that even, a part of being the Elijah message. And it was because of their faith in Jesus, the faith in the sacrifice, the faith of the Lamb, behold the Lamb of God, that led them to preach so boldly with the power and spirit. And, and so the last day people are gonna, that are going to be preaching the three angels' messages or the Elijah message is described right here in Revelation 14, 12. They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Right, and those were the elements in Elijah's preaching. When, Ahab, right. when he confronted Ahab, Ahab said, are you the troubler of Israel? And Elijah turned it around and he said, I'm not the trouble of Israel, it's you mm -hmm. because you have forsaken the commandments of God yep. and you followed Baal. Mm -hmm. So this theme is consistent and John the Baptist also upheld the law of God because he rebuked uh, Herod for his unlawful relationship with Herodias his brother Philip's wife, and John said, it is not lawful for you to have her. That's right. So John upheld the law. Mm -hmm. Elijah upheld the law. Yep. And so we have a final message in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7 is the first angel, verse 8 is the second angel, and then verses 9 to 12 is the third angel, and it's focusing on the law of God That's right. and false worship mm -hmm. and the need to get back to the true God according to the word. Yep. Within the first angel's message, you have the everlasting gospel. We talked about early on how the gospel is united with the law. You cannot separate the two. And we see that in Elijah's message. We see the sacrifice, which is an emphasis of the gospel, the sacrifice of Christ. And then we see the law of him saying, these are why we have the famine. This is why we have the problems. And then you see it in the first angel's message, the everlasting gospel, then fearing God, which is which in essence is keeping the commandments of God, fear God and keep his commandments. Which one? Well, it emphasizes within that, worship him who made, you know, the earth. Right, and well, all the why things don't you read those it. verses? Sure. Maybe not everybody that's watching this has okay. actually read. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Chapter 14, verses 6 to 12 are three angels' messages that are given before the return of Jesus in verses 14 to 16. So why don't you read the first angel, verse uh, 6 and 7. Sure. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And so very clearly here, you have God being exalted, back to worshiping him. He's the creator. We don't worship the creation. We worship the creator. We, we, we keep the commandments of God has an emphasis on the Sabbath here. And so we see those elements that Elijah was bringing out, John was bringing out right here within just the first angel's message. The hour of his judgment has come. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a call for repentance. And that's what John the Baptist was doing. That's what Elijah was doing. Right. And when you mention the Sabbath, and when uh, verse 7 says, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters, even though it doesn't specifically say Sabbath in this verse, uh, this is actually a quote from the That's fourth right. commandment. 
from uh, Exodus 20, verse 11, that says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of when uh, the fire fell on Mount Carmel in Elijah's day, then Elijah prayed, and it was uh, at the seventh time, his prayer, the seventh prayer, that's when the rain came down. So mm -hmm. we have uh, the water, Elijah tells them to pour the water on the sacrifice three times, and then, he's, and then we read that it's at the seventh time when the servant goes to look to see if Elijah's prayer has been answered, that that's when the cloud appears, and that's when the rain, when the clouds build up and the rain comes. So three times the water, seventh time the rain comes, and then we have three angels in Revelation, and the first angel's message points to the seventh day when God made the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. Mm -hmm. And another significant point is that uh, verse 6 says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. This doesn't mean that there's going to be a literal, real angel flying up in the sky. The word angel in the Greek is angelos, which is messenger, which is the same word that applies in the New Testament to John the Baptist right. when it says, behold, I will send my messenger, mm -hmm. my angelos. So this is the, the message just like John in the spirit and power of Elijah to give the last call to help people to understand what the real issues are at a time of worldwide confusion and apostasy. That's right. And the second and third angel's message is a calling out of Babylon. And we see that Elijah was calling God's people out of that false from system Baal, of worship. From Baal worship. That's right. And Pagan so he was worship. calling them out, asking them to repentance, choose a side, well, that's what we see happening within the second and third right. angel's so message. Right, yeah, so second angel, uh, verse 8, there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So the second and first angel uh, exalts true worship, the maker of heaven and earth and the everlasting gospel. Second angel warns about the fall of Babylon, false worship, and that she's made the whole world drunk. So the whole world is involved in the false teachings of Babylon, and we know from Revelation 17 that Babylon is also referred to as a woman. Mm -hmm. She's a harlot. And I shared with you this morning that as I was having my, my morning reading, I've been going through the book of Proverbs, and I was very, I was just struck with Proverbs 23, verse 27 and 28. And when I read that, I thought, I gotta share this when, when I meet with David and mm -hmm. we have this series. Uh, verse 27 says, For a whore, or a harlot, is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. She also lies in wait as for her prey, as for a prey, and sh she increases the transgression, the transgressors among men. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, there's the, the whore who's increasing transgressors among men because she's leading men to break the law of God. That's what transgression is. Uh, 1 John 3, 4 says sin is the transgression of the law. And that's what Babylon, the whore, does is she leads people away from the law of God and she leads people to be transgressors. And that's what Ahab did too. And that's what Jezebel, that's who right. was behind Ab uh, Ahab did, she led Israel away from God's law. Mm -hmm. And Elijah called them back. That's right. Back to the word. And John the Baptist, you have That's right. the mother, the daughter, and Herod all working together to kill John the Baptist. Exactly. So, and then we have the third angel's message in verses 9 to 12. The third angel followed them and said with a loud voice, and this angel warns about the beast, the image, the mark, and the judgments that are coming upon those who get the mark of the beast, just like what happened to the false prophets on Mount uh, Carmel, they were, they were slain. And God is warning about what's gonna happen to those who stay with the false system, who follow Babylon and the beast and who get the mark. And then there's the, the appeal in verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So it's, there's like the, the grand finale, the conclusion of the three angels is an appeal from God's people, the, the final Elijahs, who are giving the Elijah message of the three angels, calling mm -hmm. people away from false worship, calling them back to the true Greek, true creator, and calling them to um, this blend of commandment keeping 
and following Jesus Christ. So we see that the showdown with Elijah happened on Mount Carmel. Where is this showdown taking place with the final Elijah's and the three angels' message? Where is it taking place? At Armageddon. Okay. That's it. So let's go there. This is where we're, we're leading. Uh, Revelation 16 is all about the build-up to the final battle. Armageddon is only used one time in the Bible, and it's mentioned in verse 16. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And so here's a gathering to Armageddon, just like on Mount Carmel, Elijah told Ahab, gather Israel and bring them up to the mountain and bring the false prophets up to the mountain and we're going to have a showdown. And mm -hmm. as I've been, I've pondered this and studied this, it's very interesting that the word Armageddon is only used one time. It's, it's sort of a, a combination of two words, Ar-Megiddon. Mm -hmm. And Ar means mountain. And then Megiddon goes back to the Old Testament Valley of Megiddo, which is north of Jerusalem where a lot of battles were fought. And a lot of people think that the Valley of Megiddo is going to be the place of a literal battle between uh, the armies of Iran or China and the Israelis and there's this, or the Antichrist and they're all coming together in this little valley to fight against the Jews. Mm -hmm. But that's, it's a, it's a literal view, just like the Pharisees were expecting a literal Elijah, Elijah but it, John came not exactly the way they were expecting. That's right. And, and so it doesn't say they're gathered together to the Valley of Megiddo. The text says they're gathered together to Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And this is an interesting word. So you've got the Valley of Megiddo, but then you've got the mountain. So Mount Megiddo. And it's very significant that when you go to the Valley of Megiddo, and I've been there, you look to the west and you see a mountain range and that's Carmel. Mount Carmel mm. is right there. Oh. So you've got the Valley of Megiddo and the mountain. Mount Megiddo, our Megiddo. And so I believe that 1 Kings 17 and 18 about Elijah on Mount Carmel, that that's the background for the final gathering that takes place uh, at this place called Mount Megiddo, meaning this is the mountain of the final gathering. And when you look at the context, it's very clear, uh, David, that it's as a worldwide gathering. Yes. Uh, why don't you just read verses 13 and 14, which is the buildup to Armageddon. Sure. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Right, and then in verse 16, they're gathered to Armageddon. So here's the context, so it shows. So the players are not the Russians and the Chinese and the is Israelis, but the players are the dragon, the beast, and the false That's prophet, right. just That's like right. the false prophets of Baal. Yes. And they're gathered for the final battle, which is called Armageddon. Mm. And this is what we have here. This is the buildup to the final battle. So the final battle, just like in Elijah's day, it's the final showdown between, just like in, in those days, it was Ahab the king, Jezebel the woman behind the king, and then the false prophets leading people astray, and then the true messenger of God stressing the commandments of God and the sacrifice pointing to Christ. And so the three angels do the same thing. That's right. And then the final gathering for the showdown is Armageddon. And we find one of the beasts in Revelation 13 trying to cause fire to come down from heaven, to try to deceive the world, to, to, to worship the false, in essence, false gods rather than That's the true. Right. And, and so we see this showdown almost taking place quite literally. And you have this beast trying to cause fire to come down from heaven to cause people to believe in a false system of worship again. That's right. And that's it, it would almost be like when the false prophets uh, on Carmel were were screaming and doing all this. Uh, let's say there was a fire that came down. There wasn't back then, but in Revelation there is. Mm -hmm. In Revelation 13, it says he causes fire to come down from heaven, which is a counterfeit fire. Yes. It's a false fire, which is connected to the false prophet. That's right. So it's like there will be signs and wonders and miracles uh, as part of the deception of the devil 
to lead people to go along with Babylon and to go along with the mark of the beast. Yep, to fall and, the Antichrist rather than the Christ. That's right. And God is counteracting this with the Elijah message yep. of the three angels' messages. That's right. That's right. And, and there's something else that we didn't, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, one of our White Horse Media associates mentioned this, and I thought this was really significant that in 1 Kings 18:27, which we didn't really focus on, uh, when, when the false prophets were doing all their dancing and cutting and everything, it says that Elijah mocked them. Mm. Uh, and he, he said, where is your God? Is he sleeping or is he on a journey or where is he? And we talked about how maybe at that point, Elijah sort of stepped out from being of the voice of God and became more just Elijah, some of some self got in there. And we know that in che right after that, when the fire fell, Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he, he, his flesh took over and he ran away. That's he right. got scared. So everything Elijah did wasn't perfect. Yes. He made a mistake uh, in running away from Jezebel. We know that. And maybe he made a mistake in, in mocking them as well. But mm -hmm. uh, to me, that just the the, the conviction is on me that we should always relate to people like Jesus. That's and right. Jesus didn't mock people. Uh, he loved people. He spoke boldly, strongly. He pleaded with people. He wept, but he didn't, he didn't mock people. And mm -hmm. I think that we need to have the, re the respect that Elijah showed for Ahab mm -hmm. at the end. Uh, we need to still have respect for people, even in Babylon, That's right. just like Daniel, who worked for Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon, and Daniel respected Nebuchadnezzar. He loved him, and the point is that the three angels' message people need to bring together the best of the best, the best of Elijah, the best of Daniel, the best, ultimately, of Jesus, and to have the right spirit and to give the message in the right way, showing genuine concern for people yes. like Elijah did on Mount so Carmel when he told the people, come to me. Amen. Uh, yeah. The question is how? How do we do that? And I believe the key verse that we wanted to discuss here was yeah. in verse 15. Exactly. And that verse de describes how we are able to maintain this and do this. It says in verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. And, and so, Speaking of this, you know, we see that Elijah talks about his clothing. It talks about John the Baptist's clothing. And here at the final showdown, it's talking about God's people's clothing. So what does that symbolize? What does it represent? Well, the clothing is obviously the righteousness of Christ. Right, the garments, and the this white is garments. Gonna, this is what's going to keep us from mocking our enemies. This is what's going to keep us from acting outside of the character of God, is In that we flesh. have his righteousness. We're experiencing it. And, and that's what's going to keep the flesh, uh, helping us in keep overcoming the flesh. That's right, because nobody's, I mean, John the Baptist, his flesh kicked in too when he mm -hmm. said, are, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one that's coming or should we look for another? Yes. So John and Noah, who gave the Noah message, he got drunk later on. Elijah possibly stepped out of God's will when he mocked them. We know he did when he ran away from Jezebel. And uh, John the Baptist did when he question Jesus because even Jesus didn't come exactly the way John was expecting. Yes. So uh, we all have to be very humble and very uh, you know, willing to be corrected by the Lord and we want to follow as closely to Jesus as possible. And verse 15 is so significant because uh, verse 16 is the only time in the Bible that the word Armageddon is used, only time. Mm -hmm. And the context is the gathering of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet for the final showdown worldwide. That's what it says. And then verse 15 is the only place in the Bible where Jesus speaks, in my Bible it's in red, mm -hmm. where Jesus speaks and tells people how to be ready yes. for Armageddon. How, like John the Baptist came to prepare the way for the Lord before the great day of God. How do we get ready for the great day of God? Verse 15 is the answer. That's it. And you know, typically for a battle, we have to have armor. Good we have point. to have things to protect ourselves. What is going to protect us? It's the righteousness of Jesus. That's right. And what I love about this thought is what is that righteousness? What is that power? What's going to keep us safe during this time? 
And in Joel, it talks about the great day of the Lord. When you look up that phrase, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Joel describes it. And and I just want to bring this very quickly. In Joel chapter 2, it says in verse 28, right before this great and dreadful day, the Bible says, It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Verse 23, you have the outpouring of the latter rain, the Holy Spirit. This is what this is what causes us to be wearing the righteousness of Christ. That's right. It's it, the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. So That's it's right. not by our power, not by our might, but by the Spirit of God That's right. that we're going to be able to preach this message, not just preach it, but live it. That's right. Like it says in Zechariah, not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit. And when after the fire fell, the rain came down. And, and part of the Elijah message is we're waiting for the rain. That's we're right. waiting for the Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God. We need the Word of God. We need the power of God. And like Jesus says, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is he who watches, meaning watch out for the devil and the beast, the false prophet, the evil angels, and keep his garments, which is the righteousness of Christ, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And this impresses me that we not only need to have Jesus' white robe on us, but we need to hold on to it. Yes. We need to keep our garments. So we need to ultimately humble ourselves at the foot of the cross, confess our sins, trust Jesus as our sacrifice, uh, ask him to put his white robe on us, and through his white robe of righteousness in the Holy Spirit, we can then become obedient to God's law as we wait for the coming of Christ. What did Elijah ask the people? Come here. And what is the Spirit asking us tonight, today? In Revelation 22, 17, and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Pastor Steve, I believe God is calling us to be modern day Elijah's today. He's asking us to come. I do too. I believe that. And he's asking you to come, all of us to come. So let's come to Jesus. Let's participate in the Elijah prophecy and the Elijah spirit and the movement and the message. And let's get ready for the great day of the Lord. We hope you enjoyed this video. Before you go, check out these wonderful books for sharing. The Truth About the Sabbath is packed with information for anyone wanting to understand the Sabbath subject. Also, the 666 Beast Identified. What it means to you identifies both the beast and his strange number 666. What do the beast and his number have to do with you? Both are available in paperback and ebook versions from Whitehorse Media. We hope you've been blessed by this White Horse Media production. To support White Horse Media, please call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-782-4253. You may also send your donations by mail to White Horse Media, PO Box 130, Priest River, Idaho, 83856, or donate online at whitehorsemedia.com. And now for some breaking news. White Horse Media has just launched its new free online Bible school, Thunder in the Holy Land, filmed in Israel to help you and others discover the true teachings of God's Word. To learn more, visit whitehorsemediabibleschool.com. You'll be glad you did.